Hello, my name is Ralph Becker. I'm from the Economics Department at the University of Manchester. Here I will briefly discuss how I, how I, over the last few years, have been changing my computer labs. I will use the example of R, which we here at the University of Manchester have been using for our econometrics students quite successfully over the last few years. It requires students to actually write some code, as opposed to using a menu-driven software. While this means larger startup costs for our students, it also delivers greater rewards in terms of what students can do with their skills and, we believe, greater rewards in the job market. The key insight I want to discuss here is that it's important to focus on generic coding, coding skills rather than just exactly showing students how to achieve certain outcomes. The process of how to find out how to do something is at least as important as actually knowing how to do something. These skills are searching the internet for help, using the help function, understanding error messages and fixing or debugging code. To illustrate how we started building the practice of these skills into our computer labs, I will compare a tutorial which provides clean, ready-to-run code, how I would have presented computer labs a few years back, with computer lab instructions which guide students through the process of writing code. We think that this is very important in order for our students to practice and develop some resilience. So here we can see the two tutorials next to each other. On the left, a basic one, how I would have presented it a few years ago. On the right, the more skills-based one, how I am now presenting computer labs to my students. And it starts with the aims that are to be achieved. On the left-hand side, I would just point out to students what you want to learn, importing data, plotting time series graphs in this particular case. On the right hand side, of course, these aims are still there, but now we also have additional aims. The aims, the generic coding skills, using the help function, searching on the internet, trial and error, finding mistakes. And it's very important that students understand this is normal because they think, if I don't know the answer, I've done something wrong, I haven't learned enough. But it's very important they understand that searching for solutions is a super important part of programming. So what does that then mean in practice? Let's have a look at this one. We start by getting familiar with error messages because they're just part and parcel of programming. Here on the left hand side, you can see a totally correct command to import a data file using the read.csv function. Here on the right hand side, we provide a code, but it's incorrect. In particular, it uses capital letters uh, here and we need to use small ones and ask case sensitive, a very important message. So students would get an error message. We actually show them the error message here and say, don't, you know, don't be surprised if you see that. We expect that. That's very important to get them familiar to this and then give them a task to solve this problem. We give them enough information, we think, to solve the problem, i.e. we tell them about case sensitivity. So this is very important, getting students familiar with error messages. The next example is down here. In uh, R, you need to tell R that a certain piece of information is a date. So here on the left-hand side, in the basic tutorial, we give the totally correct command to do that. On the right-hand side, a little further down here, we give the same command. It's down here, but it's incomplete. In particular, it doesn't have the completed date formatting information which you have to give to R. Now, we are giving them the task to complete that and previously we even give them three examples. The correct one is one of them, but also we give them more information about how to figure out what these quite cryptic things actually mean. So we ask them how to search on the internet for information. It is very important that you normalize this process because students tend to be quite reluctant to actually search. They think it's plagiarism and it's totally okay and common practice. So build that into your tutorials, that process. Next, you can see another example here. We are asking students to uh, here to select subsample. Again, we're giving them a task with the necessary information here, for instance, to use that percentage in percentage operator. 
let me move on. I want to show you what, what we mean by scaffolding in some sense. We've, we've done that already. You want to help students, give students enough information to be able to perform a challenge task. So that means, for instance, here we're producing some graphs and on both occasions here we have, because the first graph we produce, totally complete code. So students can start and understand that. And then there is another graph where we include several lines. And again, we give the complete code. So now we go to the second part of the tutorial. We're asking students to import a second data set. On the left hand side, again, in the basic tutorial, you can see the complete code on the right hand side now because that is the second time we're asking them to import data we're producing an incomplete code and we're expecting students to have learned from the first set again here we are subsetting or selecting a subsample we've done that previously so again we expect that students have learned and we are not presenting them anymore with the complete code but with gaps in the code that students have to complete so they can't just copy and paste the code into their own software. Now we're getting to, to more graphs here. Where again for that new data set we are starting with complete code. Right? Both the, in the basic tutorial on the left and the new tutorial on the right the first graph will be exactly produced. Then the second graph in the basic tutorial again I would have just given the complete code on the right hand side we are now setting a student to challenge to complete that code but it achieves exactly the same as the first type of code so students should be able to just make the necessary adjustments to make this run again we are showing them the results so they know when they get it right and then there's the third bit of um, graph again this it's even more complete but again they can see the result so this is now very important Give them challenges, but always give them the information to solve the challenge and the result so they can check whether they got it right. To complete this video, I want to give you a brief insight on how to use our markdown to create this structure where you show faulty code, but also the right result. And this is just a very nifty feature of our markdown, which we make use of here. As I said, this is not an R Markdown uh, teaching or training video, so um, you'll have to go to the internet and Google yourself or find the help functions. I just want to show you this um, little trick. So here, for instance, that was the uh, import of the data, which created an error message. Here is the incorrect code. So I'm writing everything that's in these triple uh, marks. This is a bit of code. And later when we ask our studio to produce the PDF, R will interpret this as code and everything else is going to be text. So here is this faulty bit of code and we want to look at like code, but actually it's faulty. So we don't really want to execute it. And therefore, in this code chunk, they're called code chunk, I can include this option, evaluate equals false. So actually, when we produce the PDF, this bit of code will not be evaluated because it would produce, if I ran it, and you can do, you can do that here, if you ran this, it would, of course, produce this error message because read.csv should be written with small letters. Then of course because I, I need the data imported into the file to do later things I need to write the, the right code. The right code is here. Yeah, this is the right code so you can see read and CSV both start doesn't have capital letters. So this code runs but I don't want to show it to the students. So here I include, include an option echo equals false. This means this tells R to run the code, but when you produce the PDF, not to show the code. However, afterwards we have the data available. So you can see, perhaps I'll show you one more example, that I have these sort of pairs of code 
everywhere. Here's another one. This is where we have to uh, set um, the date variable in the date format. Down here is the correct code with the correct formatting for these dates. However, when I produce the PDF file for the students, I do not show that code, echo equals false. And in fact, this is the bit I wrote, of course, first, and then I just copied and pasted this and took out certain things I wanted students to fill in. So I replaced this formatting here with just four X's. And here I have eval equals false. So R isn't gonna execute this code, but it will show it. All right? So in this way, you can show incomplete code, but in the background have the correct code running uh, for your file. That was just a little glimpse and a little trick we use, uh, a feature we use from the R Markdown file. I hope you found this helpful and wish you much fun writing computer labs for your students.